we still don't fully understand the wind. Wind is a turbulent phenomenon. It fluctuates, it's chaotic, it's unpredictable. And so it's a very challenging topic to, to analyze. I don't think most people realize just how much energy is available above our heads. And it really could change civilization as we know it. There's a mecca of energy up there. What are we waiting for to tap into it? The fact of the matter is we have an oil-based civilization and without oil and without cheap oil, a lot of things are going to have to change. And if we don't have strategies and, and new technologies that can help smooth that transition, I think we're going to really be in trouble. Now the question then becomes is which of these technologies should we use? And the point to realize is that there will be costs and benefits of each. I think more resources need to go into developing new technology than just expanding the use of what we have right now. What we have right now is clearly not good enough to be economical and be able to replace fossil fuels rapidly. Getting the next technological breakthrough should be the most important thing we should be funding. My background is really in both engineering and meteorology. And wind power to me is the perfect match between those two fields. Any kind of wind energy devices try to capture the winds and they want to get away from the Earth's surface because that's where the dissipation, the slowing down, the interference occurs. So if you can get away from it, you can tap into the stronger winds. With traditional devices like wind turbines, you need to build gigantic towers, gigantic structures to get higher and higher and higher. And so the beauty of airborne wind energy is that you skip that step entirely. You try to get up there with a very light device without any need for foundations and you just get straight to the point where the winds are higher. And with a light device, relatively inexpensive, wow, that's, that's, a, that's a dream. <laughs> And it's that dream that drives hundreds of innovators and companies around the world to develop airborne wind energy technology. While each device varies in its complexity and generation method, they all share the same goal. To capture the immense power of high altitude winds. So at AVIC 2013, for the first time, we have the possibility to unite and join with all the Arbon wind energy community. And right now we are in the capital, in the heart of Berlin. Over 100 years ago at the Tempelhof airfield, Orville Wright flew his manned aircraft to an astonished crowd. Today, developers converge on the same field to display what they believe will be the next evolution of wind energy. <laughs> It is the first time we generated electricity from airborne wind in Berlin. And we not just generated it, we also used it properly. We just powered the whole event of the Airborne Wind Energy Conference right in the field, which is actually a capability for that technology to bring in electricity to places where there is not. The Anakite is flown by joystick where you can reel in or reel out the lines together and also uh, makes a differential or collective steering of the kite. But uh, most I prefer uh, to let the autopilot work. This technology provides electricity for 3,000 to 5,000 hours per year. It's quite permanent. There's 1.4 billion people on this planet who don't have access to any modern energy services. 
Now you have a device that is relatively easy to set up and that can provide electricity where nothing else is available. I think that's a place where airborne wind energy has a huge amount of potential because the idea that you could have a mobile platform that you could kind of chase the wind uh, anywhere you could drive a truck, you could, you could drag that trailer and we can you know, make it rugged enough to survive these kind of off-grid environments, then that's a big game changer for a lot, of, a lot of people, especially in the developing world. Airborne wind energy is not limited to electricity generation. It also has the potential to cut down emissions in transportation. Back at the Tempelhof Airfield, another German-based company, SkySails, is showcasing their massive inflatable kite. Established in 2001, they have developed a complete kite system to serve as auxiliary power for cargo ships at sea. The kite is uh, installed in the, in the, at the bow of the ship. There is a 300 meter long line, and the kite is flying in front of the line in um, figures of eight, and uh, towing the ship with about 30% the, um, the propeller force, and so it saves 30% uh, of fuel. Fully automated, so also launch and recovery, and also the complete flight is uh, controlled by uh, controllers. The flying system, with the flying uh, automation, it uh, was a very easy and straight way, but um, to have the automation on board for launching and retrieving the system, that was a hard way to learn, because uh, we have salt water, sun, corrosion everywhere. It's so emotional when you travel with wind, when you feel the wind is pulling you along on a sailboat, on a kite buggy, or whatever. And, um, and Stefan, uh, my friend, we came up with the idea of uh, building a car that is propelled uh, by kites and windmills. At Cooper Union in Manhattan, Dirk Gion is showcasing the Wind Explorer, a record-breaking electric vehicle. In 2012, he attempted to cross the entire Australian continent using only wind power. And then we started on the west coast, the idea was to follow the coast along Australia to Sydney, driving during the day and finding a spot where we could set up the windmill and re recharge the batteries. Stefan was just going electric and we pulled the kite and once the kite got speed it overtook us and pull pulled, you know. So the combination electric car and kite is perfect. This little car proved that you can cross Australia on $10 of electricity. That's all we did. The rest we did with wind power, with kites, and it's amazing. Airborne wind technology can also be developed on a personal size scale that can be used by hobbyists and for educational purposes. When the cerveau lent bouge, when it is in movement, the wind apparent on the turbine est beaucoup plus élevé. Là, il vole à près de 20 mètres secondes. Et donc, l'énergie produite, euh, reçue et transformée par la, la turbine, permet d'alimenter le ruban LED. These smaller designs are one example of the low complexity airborne wind energy movement, which is characterized by radical simplicity and utilizing commercial off-the-shelf technology and repurposed components. Uh, because this, this field is relatively new and is wide open, we need to test so many different elements, uh, not only in power extraction, but in control. Um, and in order to do that, both efficiently and economically, uh, we tend to use a, a lot of recycled um, or off-the-shelf uh, components, like bike parts. So when you come up to a machine and, and you see it in action, you understand what's going on. You, so we're trying to make kite energy a lot more accessible to, uh, to people in general. And our fondest ambition is uh, to provide something useful for people who need it. These children's toys have a hidden power to transform the world. There are no shortage of skeptics that are quick to point out the many hurdles airborne wind energy needs to overcome to become a viable energy alternative. There's some healthy skepticism out there, um, just like with every new technology. Every new technology, every new concept scares, scares people. Uh, airborne wind energy is a fascinating space. There's, uh, no, there's no doubt that there's a tremendous amount of energy circulating higher off the ground than nearer to the ground. Um, that doesn't mean we can actually capture it in any effective or economically viable way. Um, the real issue is how risky the technology is, not in terms of what it will do, but what the chances of success are. 
if it's amazing, even even if the benefits are really good and technology is extremely risky and extremely expensive to develop, it's quite unlikely that the private sector will go in and do that. States, the state has to step in in one form or the other. That's how nuclear technology got developed. That's how genomics got developed. And that's probably the best way in which alternatives to fossil fuels will get developed. But these are judgments, right? People can disagree. I mean, I can say that I don't, that I think something is not going to be feasible for the next five years, and tomorrow you can have a billion piece of insight, and it can appear all of a sudden. That's why many of the developers realize the need for credibility and integrity when they address these issues. I think the most important in not only the engineering skills, but to do what you say you are going to do by the time you're saying you want to do that. There is no excuse if you don't meet the goal. It's just what it is. We have to be credible. If we state something and then we are not able to demonstrate results, so in the past, uh, there have been a lot of situations that uh, have been uh, detrimental in that, that sense. But what is needed is a, a real uh, um, joint effort to try to solve uh, the various issues which are still there. I think it's difficult to collaborate among companies personally, uh, very practically. Each company wants to be there first. But there are for sure some areas where uh, collaboration can be achieved. I have really seen myself the transformation of this business. In 2009, the companies, there were a few airborne wind energy companies. There wasn't even one term that categorized all of them. And uh, I organized the very first conference on airborne wind energy in 2009. They had never met one another. They had never spoken. The CEOs never spoke with one another. But they came to the conference and they opened up for the very first time to one another. And every single talk kind of had the same points. So all of a sudden it was obvious that there's a benefit in working together and collaborating more, and they did. It's easier if there's 25 companies as opposed, as opposed to only one. Airborne Wind Energy has begun to make its way into the public perception. In 2014, the Disney film Big Hero 6 increased the cultural zeitgeist showing a near future world where floating turbines are spread across the landscape. These massive kite farms are where many developers see the technology heading in the future. So if it's about the far future, and that's 10 years is a reasonable far future, a kite farm is something where the kites are flying using the full airspace in three, in three dimensions. They are sighted as close as possible. Each unit is as smart as the whole system. If you really want to change the energy mix of humanity, uh, of society in the next 20 to 30 years, you have to go to a very large scale. That's absolutely unavoidable. So we're talking about devices that are on the megawatt kind of scale, and we're talking about a lot of them. Uh, and that's what you need to do because the human consumption of electricity is immense. We're gonna see our machines uh, that are working now at small scale, scale up to monstrous proportions. And uh, at that point, it's just gonna be so manifest that it's real. I feel like I'm part of something that not only has a, a objective potential, the winds aloft are objectively <laughs> stronger than near the surface. There is truly a potential for something cheaper that uh, can generate electricity in a smarter and simpler way. I have never felt more confident that uh, this, this technology, this idea, this vision is going to happen. I have no financial interests. I have, I'm no member of any of these companies. I couldn't care less about which one becomes the winning one, which one makes it, which one doesn't. I support uh, all of them in principle because I believe in the scientific background, in the scientific reasoning behind airborne wind energy and uh, I'm very very optimistic about their future. The AWF feature documentary is far from finished. We'd love to meet with more airborne wind developers and companies as the film continues to mature alongside the field. Follow us at awdocumentary.org or email us at awdocumentary at gmail.com for general feedback or if you're interested in becoming part of the film.